Hello, it's great to be with you. For those of you who might be new to us, my name is Jitesh. I'm one of the ministers at Holy Trinity. It's my great joy just to share a few words with you now. And we're going to be thinking about today the whole idea of stories. And so I thought I'd start with uh, some of my favourite stories, a bit of a household show and tell, some of the things that I really love being captivated by. Um, Perhaps one of my favourite stories of all time is this hefty story, The Lord of the Rings, uh, an epic story between good and evil and good eventually triumphing over evil. When I was a kid, I used to love detective stories and the whodunit. So here's a book that I read as a kid, the complete novels and stories of Sherlock Holmes, the original tales of detective mystery. Next up is an amazing story of family tension, of intrigue, of redemption. It is, of course, The Lion King. You know that you love it. It's wonderful. And then lastly, here's uh, the latest Star Wars in 4K ultra high definition. It is amazing. And you haven't, if you haven't seen it yet, um, I'm not going to give away the plot. It's a great film. We love stories. I love stories. Many of us love stories. But what I want us to think about today isn't just any old story. It's the greatest of stories, the story of all stories, the story of the gospel, the story of what God's done in our lives. We're going to base a few thoughts out of some words from the Apostle Paul from 1 Corinthians 15, where he writes this beginning in the first verse. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to remind you of the gospel I preach to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. For what I received I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas and then to the Twelve. After that he appeared to more than five hundred of the brothers and sisters at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles, and last of all he appeared to me also, as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles, and do not even deserve to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it is I or they, this is what we preach, and this is what you believed. Well, in those words, Paul is addressing the church in Corinth. They've got a lot of things wrong with it, but he's saying that they got one thing right. That when Paul first preached the gospel message to them, they received it, they believed it. And he says that they took their stand on it. They built their life on the true story of the gospel, of Jesus coming of his miraculous life, of his dying for us, of his being raised to new life and ascended to the Father. They said that that is true and that we're going to build our lives on it and they were saved. And what Paul is doing is he's saying, I'm going to remind you of that story because you need to stand strong in that story even today. And what he's doing is it's almost like he's pouring concrete over their feet so that it's set so that whatever happens around them whatever hurricanes that pass over them or earthquakes around them, they find themselves rooted to the spot, unable to move, stood on the surety of the gospel story. And I think for us that has a great lesson for us today, that actually whatever goes on around us, whatever this season of coronavirus brings to us, we also can stand sure, rooted, in the story, the wonderful story of the gospel, the gospel story. And I've just got two ways that Paul suggests we do this. Firstly, he says that we are to live in the power of the gospel story. We are to live in its power. He says in verse 2, By this gospel you are saved, if you hold firm to the word I preached to you, otherwise you have believed in vain. He's saying that this gospel story that saved you in the past has ongoing effect in the present and the future. It's not just for back then when you were first saved. 
it's for now. It has the power of salvation now in the present and also in the future. And this speaks the same to us, that many of us watching when we first heard the story of the gospel and really believed it, it meant that we were saved. We were brought into God's family. It's a wonderful time and a wonderful day. But the gospel story wasn't just for then. It's for now as well. And it's for all the days to come. It has ongoing power to bring salvation. It's really interesting that many of the stories that we tell that are most powerful have some sense of a salvation theme in it. I think it really keys into a deep awareness of a need for a salvation and a saviour that's within the very core of our being. It might be a story that is of salvation from the power of evil like in Lord of the Rings or a story about the power of salvation from life's broken circumstances, or maybe a story of literal escape from prison and incarceration, like in Prison Break or The Great Escape. All those stories just point to a need for salvation that we're innately aware of in our lives. And many of us seek out a story to live that will bring about salvation. For some of us, it might be the money salvation story. That if I just get enough money, if I just have enough, well then I'm going to be protected. I'm going to have my own little insurance bubble and nothing's going to harm me. I'm saved from anything that could happen. For some of us, it's the significant salvation story that if I just pull myself up by my own bootstraps and make something of myself, well, I'm saved from ignominy and feelings of failure. For others of us, it's the love salvation story. That if I can just find the right person to love me or the right people to love me and adore me, or that will meet my deep need to be loved and will save me from any feelings of despair. The problem with all those stories is that they don't ultimately have the power to save. That actually those stories are created by us and are limited and finite and in the end prove false that there's no significance that be, can be great enough and prestigious enough to save us, that there's no money that can be a large enough deposit in the bank account that will save us, that there's no love of other people that could be deep and everlasting enough to bring about our salvation. None of those stories can save. The only story that brings about salvation is the gospel story, God's story. It's the only story that speaks about what's really wrong within us and what we really need saving from, which is us ourselves, our inwardly twisted desires and sinful tendencies and their disastrous consequences. It's the only story that speaks about a saviour powerful enough to deal with it. Jesus himself, God himself coming as one of us and breaking the power of sin from the inside out, taking it upon himself, giving us freedom, giving us the promise of eternal life, rescuing us and bringing us into salvation. Part of the gospel story's power for us is that God offers in it a brand new narrative for our lives. He says that I've stepped into your life that I've not remained distant, and what I want to do is bring my story into your story, not just as a chapter in the story, but as a story that then frames and formats and changes your entire life. That if you let me, I'll bring my story into your life story, and your life will change, and it will begin to resemble it, and it will be, begin to sing its song, and it will begin to fly in its freedom. Some of you might remember the old uh, film series based on a book, The Never Ending Story. And true to name, it had a number of parts and didn't seem to end. The first one told the story of the young boy, Bastian, who encounters an ancient story and he's just engrossed by it. And that as he reads it, he's just drawn into it. and He soon finds himself living in the story and the story living in him. He finds that his story and the story that he's part of mix and merge and became, become one. And that's what God offers to us in the gospel story. That as we just become absorbed with it, as we just 
allow it to live within us, that actually it becomes our story and we become part of it. That his words that he spoke, the most wonderful words ever heard, become words that he speaks over our life. That the miracles that he wrought in the gospel story become miracles that he wants to do in and through us in our lives. That his defeat of sin and death and the enemy at the cross and his power in the resurrection become part of our life story, the way that we live. This is all that he offers in the gospel story and it's a wonderful story and it's ours for the taking. And I want to suggest that in this season of coronavirus, where many of us are struggling, it's a story that we can dig into. It's a story that we can live in afresh and to partner with God in making that story our own. I know from my own experience when I first became a Christian, I'd never heard the gospel story before and never really realised what it meant. When I first heard it and received it and really was amazed by the implications of it, I just gave myself to getting to know the story as much as possible. I think in the first two years of my Christian life, I read nearly a hundred Christian books, just trying to delve deep into the story of what God's done and what it means for me. I remember that I listened to nearly a thousand hours of Christian teaching, just rejoicing what the story means to me. It was a precious time. It just changed my life completely. Now, of course, back then I, I, I was a university student. I had lots of time in my hand. But for many of us, it might be that we have extra time on our hands. That shutdown, lockdown has meant that there's space where there wasn't space. And can I encourage you to study the story? to make it part of your life, to meditate on it, to love it afresh, to cherish it, to allow God to write this story into our story again. Now for many of us, I'm aware that we're busy, perhaps even busier than ever, and you don't have that space and time. Well, can I encourage you, can I challenge you that if that's true of you, that in some way that you make space to hear the gospel story again, to hear what Jesus has done for you, to hear of his grace for you, to hear of the story of his redeeming love, because that's your story, that's the story of your life that he wants to write all over it. Well, that's the first thing, that we <laughs> really do live in the power of the gospel story. And then secondly, Paul suggests that we trust in the truthfulness of the gospel story. Paul goes on and in uh, the passage he speaks of the fact that this story is true. One of the objections that you might raise to what I've just been saying is that it's all very good basing your life upon the gospel story. It's all very good in a time of crisis to have, of having that hope in what Jesus has done at the cross. But what if it's not true? What if it's a lie? What if it's fiction? What if it's fake news? Some of you might be watching and you've never really believed that the Christian story is true, that these offers sound too good to be true. Well, Paul helps us here. He actually points to a certain event in the gospel story that can be proved factually, that gives a certainty to the whole gospel story, the event of Jesus' resurrection. You see, the Corinthians are having problems with believing that they might share in Jesus' resurrection. And so Paul addresses it, and as he addresses it, he helps us to understand that it really happened. And if that really happened, well, by implication, the gospel story is true, because the resurrection is at the core of it. It's its most audacious claim, and if that is true, well, it authenticates all that Jesus said, all that he did, all that he predicted, and all that he promises. And Paul gives us three proofs, as it were, for the resurrection. Three ways we know it really happened and therefore the gospel story is true. First of all, he points to a chain of eyewitnesses. He points to, first of all, Cephas, Peter, who betrayed him, and then all the apostles, and then 500 independent eyewitnesses who saw Jesus at the same time. And then even Paul himself, he says, saw the resurrected Jesus. And he says that these people are still people that you could question today. Some of them are still alive. And added to that, we would probably say that even today, there are billions across the globe who have encountered the risen Lord Jesus. 
whoever encountered him as a dead idea from the past, but as a living person. Second proof that Paul gives of the resurrection here is of scripture. He says twice in these verses, in verse 3 and verse 4, that these things happened according to the scriptures. That in the Old Testament there were over 200 predictions of what Jesus would do. And then you read the gospel story and you realise that he fulfilled every single one of them. And the likelihood of a writer or a group of writers being able to create such an intricate story, especially a group of fishermen and tax collectors that the disciples were, is close to zero. As is the likelihood that that just all happened by chance. Then thirdly, he points to himself and says, look at me, I'm living proof that Jesus rose from the dead. But at the end of the passage, he speaks about the fact that he was once the preeminent persecutor of the church. He loved killing Christians because of what they represented. But then he turns into be, being the most hardened and ferocious and energetic apostle and evangelist and preacher of the Christian faith. And he says, what could have caused that turnaround? Only one thing, encounter with the resurrected Jesus, that it really happened. And if that really happened, well, that means the whole story's true. Because Jesus is proved to be true, that his words and his promises and his predictions are true. That the gospel story is really true. And I think for us, that has great hope. It's interesting that many people considering the gospel story, especially the event of the resurrection, realising its truth, have become Christians. C.S. Lewis, who wrote the Chronicles of Noah, that great story and set of stories, was an atheist who was an expert in ancient mythology. But when he first really heard the gospel story from his friends, he realised that even though this at first seemed to be like an ancient myth, Actually, it was true. It rang true. It turned his life around. It led someone as great as Einstein to say that no myth was filled with such life that this story is true. And if you don't know that to be true, I can I encourage you to explore and find out that these things are true and they change everything. For many of us, this truthfulness of the gospel story means that in these times, we can take a firm stand on it. That we can take a firm stand on the fact that Jesus really did come as one of us in his incarnation. It means that God is really with us in the things that we're going through. We take a firm stand that Jesus really did lead the life that he's described as leading, the miraculous life where he performed signs and wonders, where he did things that no person had ever seen before. And that, that same Jesus is with us, able to do the miraculous, able to heal, able to save, able to deliver, it's the same Jesus. We can take our stand that the cross is really true, that that is, the preeminent expression of just how much God loves us. And he loves us every single day with that kind of love, the love that goes to the cross. And we can take our stand on his resurrection, that in the end, Jesus wins the victory, that his power is the greater power, that in the end, all of his purposes, all of his promises will be accomplished, including the ones he has for us. We take our stand on the truthfulness of the gospel. I want to end with some words of a poem that were written by someone called Catherine Hensky. And she was a wonderful dear old lady who uh, wrote a number of hymns, but during her 30s suffered from a debilitating illness that left her unable to get out of bed for a number of years. And during that time she wrote a poem over a hundred verses long and it was later turned into a hymn and it just spoke about what got her through those times. And it's an old hymn, you'll recognise it, some of you, and it says this. Tell me the old, old story. Tell me the old, old story of Jesus and his love. Tell me the story slowly, that I may take it in, that wonderful redemption, God's remedy for sin. Tell me the story often, for I forget it so soon. The early dew of morning has passed away at noon. Tell me the story always, if you would really be 
in any time of trouble, a comforter to me. May God's story, the gospel story, be our story today. Amen.